This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. to another World of UX Podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us on today. And as always, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Glad to have you here. Glad that you're courageous enough. I got to say that. Courageous enough to to take on a show that's not here to tickle your ear, uh, not here to make you feel good, but here to vault the discipline forward. If you love the discipline of UX, and you're on the same wavelength as us, uh, we're aligned, that you want to see things go forward, I'm sure that that you will definitely enjoy what we're going to do. And today, I have another special guest. Always love having special guests. We always call this Talk and Shop, uh, where we're going to talk about some set stuff, but then we talk about some stuff that neither one of us knows we're even going to talk about yet. Uh, But I've got a special guest with me today, and as always, I let the guests introduce themselves, so I want to... I'll give you the person's name, but I'll let them take this time to to get us started. Uh, Today, I have with me the one, the only UX researcher extraordinaire, Dr. Ari Zelmanow. Take it away, Ari. Thank you, Darren. (laughs) I'm so excited to be here. I've been looking forward to connecting on this. Um, Hello, my name is Ari. Um, I am the Sherlock Holmes of consumer and market behavior. how do I claim that name? I am a real life detective turned market detective. Love it. <laughs> I help researchers develop the confidence and skills to transform research into revenue and move from invisible to influential. Um, my goal here and why I was so excited to come on the show is I believe that research, UX research, should be a strategic role, should be the consigliere to the business, the right yes. hand to business leadership. And it's my uh that, that is going to be my dent in the universe when we make that happen. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm going to say this now before we even get into content today. If you're not connected to Dr. Ari and you have a passion for UX research, please connect with him or at least follow him. Reach out and connect if you, you want to engage with him. Uh, but connect with uh, Dr. Ari on, on LinkedIn. The, the posts that he shares are fantastic. And there's too many people with the fluffy stuff. Fluffy doesn't make for maturity. Uh, We can't, as we call it, Pollyanna. And I didn't coin that phrase. Toxic positivity is associated with being a Pollyanna. Always trying to find the good in things to the extent that we don't know where the risks are. We don't know where the challenges are. We don't know where the pitfalls are. And only people who can navigate around obstacles reach their destination. Life teaches us this. Same thing here. Ari's content is off the charts fantastic. And, and, and before he's, he's done here today, he'll tell you about his, his research engagement, his, his new learning resource that he's offering. I'm going to, of course, have some time for him to share information about that and plug that today. But let's go ahead and dive in here. And we're going to start out the same way we normally do in a talking, talking shop segment we normally start off with an introduction, but Ari's already given us an introduction, so we know who he is and what he does. But let's get into the personal side of things. Let, let's look at your history in the discipline. How did Ari get into UX? I've heard part of this story before. It's fascinating, but the, some of the listeners may not have. How did you get into UX? How did you get your start? Yeah, it was an interesting path. Um, I wish I could tell you that I had planned it from early childhood. I went to college for uh research and I I came out and I became a UX researcher, but that's not what happened. Um, What happened is I was a police detective for 10 years. I always loved investigating things. I like to understand why people did things. I liked exploring mysteries. Um, So when I was a police detective, I went back to school. I ultimately got my master's and my doctorate and I entered the world of organizational psychology for a few years and I just hated it. Um, But Uh, Through a serendipitous turn of events, I landed in a market research role for a large consumer packaged goods company. I was leading multicultural research, foresight and trends, new new product innovation, um, 
foresight and trends. It was really exciting. Um, but I got bit by the technology bug. And <laughs> at that point, I had an opportunity to join Twitter, pre-Elon Musk, um, where <laughs> I built their first research practice for their data business. And wow. their research practice, also, I helped hire their first UX designer for that business. We took um, that and, and it was very, very successful, exciting. Um, and then from there, I have now built research teams at companies like Panasonic, Indeed, Twilio, wow. and a company called Quantive, uh, which is a, an OKR enablement platform. Um, super exciting. And I found that my passion is in helping businesses make more informed and less risky decisions through research. That's fantastic. Too. And one of the things I love about that, the story, yes, but the, of course, but the passion, we, we, we tell people, if you want to thrive in UX, you need passion, not passion for a check, passion for the work, passion for the impact that we make. And, and that is such an, uh, an aspect of empowerment that I wish more people would realize because I, I saw a post. I don't know if you saw this on LinkedIn. Somebody posted something. They said, UX is boring. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a clickbaity thing. The person was literally boring. He was being transparent. And he said that UX is, UX is boring. And of course I posted a response, which I won't bother to share here. Uh, but the person never responded to my response. And, and, and I tried to let him know you gotta, one thing I, I will say, you gotta love the discipline. You gotta you do. love it. If, if you don't love it, there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues. UX, it's a beautiful puzzle. Like, yes. I think if you're thinking it's boring, <laughs> what my argument to that person would be is you're doing it wrong. Like, yes. <laughs> you're, <laughs> UX is a beautiful puzzle. It's understanding consumers, customers, users, potential customers, the problems they have, solving those problems in a profitable way that helps businesses grow. And yeah. when like, it's like trying to find that threshold, that special moment when a customer can, uh, a customer can so solve something that really bothers them or a problem that they really have and helping a business solve the problem of how do we grow? How do we continue to solve this problem, yes. but at scale? It's a cool problem. Yeah. How could you possibly be bored? I've got all sorts of metaphors that are just not <laughs> appropriate here, but, but like, I don't understand. You're doing it wrong. That's it. It's it's really that simple. Yeah. One of the things kind of by for, for me, it, you must be doing UI. It's, you, you, I, I, <laughs> I can't even imagine. I don't even, under, I don't understand. Like, I guess I would need to understand that person's definition of UX because yeah. I, I think that if it's boring, you're doing it wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you told us how you got into UX. We all have our entry point, but then there's a development point. From an acumen standpoint, how did you develop your levels of expertise? How did Ari go from where he was then to today? So I would be, uh, to be candid, I think the first entry point, the first thing that happened was the, getting a master's degree and then getting a, a doctorate helped provide a framework for research, like the foundational nice. things, the toolbox. But beyond that, um, I think I would argue that those opened the door, but me walking through the door and then taking opportunities was another thing. So the first thing I would say is get into UX. You don't have to go to a boot camp. I don't know where that came from, that people think they have to join some kind of really expensive program that has no good outcome at the end other than not even not even a certificate, really. Like, so <laughs> I, I didn't do any of that, but I when I open it, my education opened the door. When I landed my first role in market research, and really I did that by, by looking at job descriptions of roles that I thought would be super fascinating, and then taking learning opportunities in what those roles said. So if the role said something like understand uh, consumer analytics, I took a consumer analytics course through Coursera. It's free. I learned the language. I learned how to do it. I, I learned those things and I built upon those bodies. Like I looked for books. I looked at articles. I read everything that I possibly can. We have the, the wonderful thing in the modern world is, is you have Google Scholar. Look at yes. articles, read yes. things. And then <laughs> where most people will read an article, go to the back of the article where all the references are cited, read those too. So I spent a lot of time reading. 
After yeah. I got my first market research job, I found a program through the University of Georgia, uh, Principles of Market Research, and I took that so I could better bolster my my experience. And then I continued to learn everything that I could about usability, human computer interaction. I self-taught myself what I needed to know. And you mm-hmm. look at what job descriptions are and you you develop that. And then in the roles you're in, talk to others more senior practitioners. Yes. Talk to people like Darren or Nick, uh, uh, Dr. Nick Fine or me or it's people who have been there and learn from them. Now, what I would say is there's not a template. There's not like a one size fits all approach to getting but you can learn what others have done and then tread your path. Yes, absolutely. It's interesting how you, you, you remind me of something I, I've started saying. You can't stand on your own shoulders. If That's you're trying, right. <laughs> you're trying to advance somewhere, find people who've actually been there. Find people who've actually done that. Because a lot of people today are putting themselves out there. I, I always talk about on Instagram. There was a person that I I learned about who was putting themselves out there as a mentor. And this person literally had never had a job in UX. They had only been exposed to the discipline for about three to six months, but yet they wanted to be a UX influencer and they were out there posting all of this stuff, all of which was incorrect. Uh, I've seen people literally copy someone's LinkedIn post and post the exact same post. They didn't change anything. And they put it out there. They didn't share. How come you didn't just share it? If if you thought it was something that was good and valuable, just share it. But no, they copied it. They selected it. Control C or whatever uh, operating system you use for copying something. And they pasted it. And then when I told the person, hey, didn't you get this from Arvind Dizon? Didn't he just say the same exact thing? At first, the person responded. Then they deleted their response. And then they went silent. Okay, so in saying nothing, you said something. And it's amazing how people do this kind of stuff, but you you got to talk to people. And I see your wheels turned in there. You got to see. Go ahead. Go ahead. You got something burning there. Just, <laughs> I, I just don't understand that. Like, <laughs> don't don't position yourself as the expert. Um, I would rather that person position themselves as, hey, I'm going to document my learning journey and maybe you can learn yes. along with me. Yes. Like, there's no shame in saying I'm new to a field and I'm learning this as I go. There is a lot of shame and a lot of harm that can be done from trying to teach people <laughs> something you know nothing about. Yes. And it's, it's matter of fact, this is uh, sort of flipping some of our topics here. Let's get into UX celebritism. It, it, it's happening at epidemic proportions. I mentioned Instagram. It's happening on TikTok. I haven't seen any good UX content on Instagram. I haven't seen any good content on 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 TikTok. It was funny. I, I did hear a person once talk about how they were there's I'm sharing a lot of information on Instagram. And and I was oh oh, that's not a good sign. Then I started seeing some of the content. And I'm like, yeah, you know, no sense in me getting excited. It's more of the same. People want to be influencers. Yeah, they want to be a celebrity. Yeah. But that's there's a difference between wanting to make the field better and improve research. And wanting your 15 plus minutes of fame. Yes. Like if you're doing this for likes, like do something else. Like, I mean, I don't really have another way. I just, yeah. like if you're doing it to improve the field, then be part of improving the field. If you're doing this because you're looking to, to get likes or you're tr- looking to get shares or you're looking to, this is, um, there's, but there's better ways to do that. There's better content you can share. Just yes. share some selfies of yourself on, <laughs> on a platform and it'll be fine. Or, or do a dance video or something. I don't know. But I just think that like putting yourself out there as like a UX expert or a research expert without any knowledge of that field at all, well, it, it's really harmful. Like you look at all the people that have been laid off today yeah. or that are looking for work and you're giving these people shitty advice that is causing them to spend time, effort, energy applying for jobs in a way that is absolutely not going to work for them. Um, and and yeah. and then uh, these people getting frustrated. I, I see posts, they make me so sad, man. People are like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm, I've been doing this for eight months. Well, it's because you're taking the wrong advice. Yep. Yep, pretty sad. Folks, beware of an influencer 
that show signs that they've never been influenced. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Like you, you say it right. You can't stand on your own shoulders. And look, when I started, like I read Steve Portugal's book. I read the mom test by Rob Fitzgerald. Like, am I saying that these are the end all ways? No, but they built a foundation for me to begin to experiment, iterate, test, and then form my own ways. And then I went out and did, did research and conducted before I was a uh, before I was a researcher. In fairness, I've conducted hundreds of interviews. I was a police detective. I have right. I've, I've investigated things. Like it's it's not it's not enough to. And I learned from those. I learned from interview and uh, advanced interview and interrogation techniques from the Reed Institute. Like I learned from a lot of different sources. And I think where a lot of people go off the rails is they're like, okay, I need to read only research content. And what I would say is yes. be a polymath, yep. read other things, yep. like learn business, learn, learn product, read some product management stuff, read some, Hey, if you're, if you're into it, learn to code, uh, learn data science, um, learn, learn, learn other disciplines and then apply yes. those here. Like, and you can even do that in terms of like biology and physics and, yep. um, Everything. There's all sorts of disciplines. I think UX is one of the most unique disciplines because it, it incorporates thinking from all of these. Yes, absolutely. I talked to someone earlier today who transitioned into UX from anthropology. And mm. one, of the, one of the things we talked about was just the ed, a real, a genuine educational process includes rigor. And, and that rigor builds discipline. Which is one of the reasons why I'm so anti boot camp because they don't actually have any of that. It, it's not the the pedagogy is not properly structured. There's no science backing the way they're approaching things at all. They scratch the surface. You cannot go right around and scratch the surface of everything, and then call yourself becoming a practitioner after that. And the the people who do go to boot camps and achieve success is not because the boot camps foster success. It's because those people had certain personality traits that lend themselves to success. <laughs> and I've talked to them. I've seen them. Uh, the boot camp set people up for failure. A hundred percent. You can get everything, any information you can get from a boot camp, you can get from the internet the without a boot camp. Yep. And the problem with the boot camp <laughs> is people aren't using jobs to be done language. People aren't hiring a boot camp because they want to learn principles and theory. They want to get a job. Yep. The problem is, is that boot camps, that's not the outcome. You spend $5,000 and you get cool. You get some stuff to put in your portfolio. <laughs> Guess what? Reach out. I'll show you how to put stuff in your portfolio without spending five thousand dollars. Exactly. Um, I, I it's it's disturbing because they these these they it's it it almost I guess the word I would use it almost feels predatory. I was about to say the same thing. Matter of fact, I've heard that they're on the verge of starting to label boot camps as predatory in the state of California. That people are, they're having their fill of it. When you think about learn, like you talked about pedagogy. And so what I would say is this, when you think about like good learning theory and you think about learning outcomes, those, the the learning, the outcomes of boot camps don't align with what students' expectations of those outcomes should be. It's a real, it's a real problem. And yet you see these people and I, I don't think I should call out names, but like they, that's what they sell is, <laughs> is this dream. And when you sell a dream with no connection to, to getting that dream, it's, I can only speak for myself, but I would have a hard time looking at myself in the mirror. Yeah. When you said that, you made me think, I started thinking about Barnum and Bailey circus. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, a, it's a circus. It's, it's a circus. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's just absolutely disturbing. Um, and we now have a bunch of people who would consider themselves like juniors and they would consider themselves qualified and they're going to land in a role and there's going to be some expectations and they're not going to be able to meet those expectations. And it's, it's, we're, we're, we're creating a situation where it's not, an, it's not ideal. Yeah. I'll even go as far here as I'm making a statement. It would probably get me in a little bit of trouble potentially, but this kind of trouble I welcome. I have worked with some boot camp grads over the course of my career and I cannot think of one of those experiences that didn't cause me to lose some sleep. It was really bad. That's that's rough. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to why I went to the university. I went to the University of Georgia certificate program 
because it was through a university and I ended with a certificate. The thing that drove me to it were several proctored exams. Mm -hmm. And then it yes. allowed me to, to get um, the certification through the insights association. I wanted to, I wanted some, at that point in my career, I wanted some stamp of approval, which is what I expect probably some of these boot camp people want to, except they're getting a stamp of approval from like, Bob's boot camp. And like what I say is who cares about Bob's boot camp? At least like, you know, like what does Bob know? Like, yeah. I was just on another show and they asked me, what do you think boot camps need to do? Do you think if they retool things that you could ever get on board and supporting boot camps? I said, I just put two big thumbs down and I made the noise and and I said, uh, no, uh, absolutely not. I can't because they would have, and I've said this when I did my show on the UX Bootcamp Bruhaha, they would have to completely blow up everything that they're doing because they make false promises. They they lie consistently. Everything revolves around hype. And it's like they have no concern for the well being of the discipline. And anytime somebody, that's strike three. I, I, I can't support anything like that. And they're not going to retool. Because there's probably a bunch of legal ramifications associated with that that would keep them from retooling. They already have people starting to learn how to get refunds from them, as it is now. So no, I I, I can't support that. So, and, and sadly, it's tied to celebritism because a lot of the celebrities are former bootcamp grads, or they're not former bootcamp grads. They are bootcamp grads, and so yeah, I can't. We can't support that kind of stuff. I think it's the Dunning Kruger effect, right? You go yes, and you yes. think you're an expert before you're actually an expert. Um, and so you graduate and you're like, wow, I understand this really well. <laughs> and you don't because you've never used it. You've never faced any of the problems in UX. You've never faced problems of democratization. You've never faced problems with stakeholder management. Yep. It's not, if, if you're thinking about research, just, just, as a, as a discipline, just because you've done research in high school doesn't make you qualified to do research at, in, in, for, for a multi-billion dollar company. Amazing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You just said something. I was taking a note because you said something else that, that um, I want to sort of interject here. What would you say are key modes of operation that people are overlooking that they need to be more informed about? You mentioned stakeholder management. Uh, as an example, what other things come to mind for you that's critical that people learn in order to be successful in UX? I think the single biggest thing that people need to learn is how to position themselves as a consultant rather than as a service provider. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, I, either as a designer or as a researcher. It is um, it is a problem that Dr. Nick Fine and I have been working on. We can talk about that in a few minutes. But um, not being able to present your point of view or your idea or your concept in a way that is not watered down, that you're not showing fealty to somebody just because <laughs> they're in a different role, you're not bending the knee, that you are standing up tall for what you believe in, that is that to me is one of the yes. biggest problems facing us today. And it has been compounded by the thing we were just talking about. You have people who are coming out of boot camps and sure, Maybe they know some, how, some basic interview techniques now, but what they were missing is how do I take knowledge about a customer or market dynamic and apply that to, the, to a business problem? It's really the last mile. It's what I call the last mile of research. It's how do we develop, uh, present, and defend a point of view on what we've learned or on a way that we're designing something or on a way that we're solving a problem? I think that's one big issue. I think the second, I think stakeholder management, stakeholder communication is, mm -hmm. is another area. Yep. Yep. And if you notice, none of these things are research methods. I, <laughs> I believe, right. That, that if a researcher, a, a junior researcher can get far enough with five key research methods, um, mm -hmm. those are interviews, basic surveys, desk research, field observation, and usability and concept testing. Now I'm not saying that's all the methods I'm right. saying that like, there are spinoffs from those, and there are hundreds and hundreds of research methods. But if you don't have those foundational five, you shouldn't be moving on to the others. Yep. Like, don't start thinking about conjoint or max diff or <laughs> insert advanced method here until you've mastered the basics. Yes. Um, and so I think, Matt, like, this is the another problem is that everybody wants to be a 
like a super secret specialist, but you have to, you have to learn uh, the basics first. I, I was sitting with my, my kids, uh, my, my, my son took this basketball camp and, you know, it's funny, you watch these kids, they want to do all these fancy spin moves, stand at the free throw line, <laughs> get 50 free throws, get 50 shots in that basket first. How, when I told them that I'm, I'm coaching my son's soccer team, the other thing is I said, uh, they play eight on eight at, the, at this level. So I asked them, uh, how many people are on the team at a time uh, on the field at a time? Eight. How many of them have the ball? One. Let's learn the fundamentals that don't require the ball first. Um, <laughs> you have to learn the fundamentals. Yes. Figma. I will call them out here. I don't know if you saw my post. Figma did a piece about they offered a, a free design course. The things they wanted people to learn, none of them were based on fundamentals. It was it was all things like affordance. Wait a minute. This is an introductory design course, and you're going to start off talking about consistency and affordance. There's people that have been doing UX for five years that don't know anything. <laughs> they can't talk to you about consistency and affordance. Where's the fundamentals? People want they want to microwave their path. And 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 it's and it's it's self-destructive. Fit fundamentals are phenomenal. They're phenomenal, and that's the foundation of going on. Then you can learn about affordances, then you can learn about consistency, then you can learn about all these other things, but not in a not in an introductory design class. Absolutely not. And that, I think like it's funny because we talk about research and design and we start thinking about things like Figma and design and all of those things. And one of the things that I think is also like profoundly under underused, under, under considered is basic communication skills. So how yep. to present to an audience. And second is writing skills, how to write a persuasive, brief argument in favor or against something in a way that matters. Um, because that's our, our job is to influence the business. We're, that's, that is fundamentally what we do. In UX, we are trying to influence the business yes. to take a course of action or to avert another course of action. As researchers, I'm trying to influence the business to consider the customer or market dynamics in making a decision. If you don't understand the basics of influence, and it's clear that many don't, um, how, how do you expect to be successful with that? Yep. Like, how many times do you see a, a, a young researcher, probably a boot camp graduate, couldn't help but take the swipe there, um, come in and and present a deck to to stakeholders. And the deck will look like this. I, I can see it as clear as day. It's going to have a cover slide with some fancy title. Next slide is going to be, here are the research questions and objectives. Slide three is now going to have some methodology. Slide four might have some sample frame. Slide five, by slide five, six, or seven, you might get into recommendations. <laughs> and um, the problem with that is a few fold. One is um, people don't make decisions that way. And two is you're bearing the lead. You're bearing your point of view. You're now creating arguments about the wrong things, which is like methods and sample frame and other things that quite candidly, if you're the expert, Shouldn't even be up for debate, but we make them up for debate because we position it all wrong. Yeah, absolutely. But great, great stuff. Let's jump over to another topic. You always, I, I constantly see these fantastic posts I mentioned earlier about UX research. What would be some things that you might address? What some things you feel people should understand? You already talked a little bit about this, but to help people to be of the, of the right mindset. Somebody, I want to be a UX researcher. Um, what, what's part of the mindset and, and what's happening in UX research today? You can, you can go on a rant, complete rant about what you think about UX research in general here. <laughs> I'm going to say you, you need to do research the detective way. The detective way is three things. It is being able to collect evidence, collect evidence and understand how to impartially collect evidence. You don't want to contaminate yes. evidence. You don't want to yes. contaminate your scene. You don't want to inject <laughs> bias into things. The second thing you need to be able to do to be awesome. a good researcher is you've collected evidence. How are you going to build a case from that evidence? What does this evidence mean? How are you going to build the story that says, um, this is, I'm going to use a detective metaphor here, a burglary. The door was kicked open. The window's broken. The alarm's going off. Property's missing. That's a burglary story. I just convinced you that there's a burglary, maybe. Um, <laughs> and the third is being able to tell that story in a compelling way. 
using the what what Aristotle uh, formed thousands thousands of years ago. Ethos, pathos, logos. You appeal. You need to be credible. You need to appeal to emotion, and you need to appeal to logic. If you don't have those three things in t- your storytelling, mm. it is going to fall flat. It is not going to hit home. It's going to do that. And in building your case and telling your story, the other thing uh, uh, that what separates the uh, wheat from the chaff, the 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 marquee <laughs> researchers from those that will always be uh, taking service orders at the fast food counter are the ability to tie <laughs> business things to um, uh, tying research to business outcomes. Those are simple. It's only five growth. People want businesses want predictable growth. Businesses want the ability to move faster than the competition. Mm -hmm. Businesses want mitigated risk that minimizes loss. Businesses want uh, the agility to adapt to unforeseen events and circumstances. And businesses want increased value for the business through increased customer value. They don't just want increased customer value. There's not a business under the sun that is going to spend a million dollars a month generating customer value to make a hundred dollars. Not going to (laughs) happen. Right. (laughs) They want to have business value. Now, UX is the vehicle to create business value through customer value. Um, Those five things, they don't do that. The problem is in with the field of research is that we are so myopically focused on methods and tools and AI and machine learning and natural language processing and large language models and what's the next thing. And, and then, um, which leads to this idea of democratization. Well, I can use maze. So since I can, I can use maze, I'm a researcher. I can use Figma. I'm a designer. It's the tools. So by thinking about that, you're, that is research is a verb and a noun. If the, the action of conducting research verb, sure. And I, I would argue that we could probably, you and I, give us a few days, we could probably teach somebody how to use Maze and conduct interviews and be uh, have a baseline level of, of competence, maybe not full yeah. proficiency, but competence. Now, what they do with those research findings is then what would a professional researcher, a noun, yes. it does. They're the one that I just said we could teach somebody to collect the evidence, true, but can they build the case and tell the story with the expertise and specialization of what I would consider a consigliere or if you like game, like that's from uh, consigliere is a concept of like the, the right hand, the, the, the right hand to the Don. So if you've watched the Godfather, Don Corleone, his consigliere was Tom Hagen. Yeah. Tom Hagen gave him advice. You don't like Godfather game of Thrones, the right hand <laughs> to the king or queen the person giving advice to that. That is a professional researcher, and it is a specialized skill. It is why the the concept of democratization is laughable, because sure, we can democratize collecting evidence, but democratizing the noun of research is is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. And you just transition into the next topic, (laughs) democratization. Let's expound and give some people some real information, the real, the, the truth, the nitty gritty. I, I keep coming up with all, what's come up with a bunch of synonyms. Democratization is all the rage, but it's, it's like, I'm, I'm reminded of the old fable of the emperor's new clothes. You know, he thought that he was walking around with the finest silks. He was mm-hmm. butt naked. The democratization. And I, I told somebody earlier today, and I think we've talked about this on LinkedIn before too, the initial concept of democratization I'm going to mention this and then let you let you run with it was not for other people to do research. The initial concept of democratization was for everybody to play a part in the synthesis of data, not in, Hey, we don't have enough people. Let's let, I mean, it's a, it's a stupid concept even before it gets to UX because wait a minute, you want me to take five people who have a completely different job, leave their job, and come over here and help me do my research job. Somebody's work is not being done under that that proposition. Somebody's work is not being done, and the work that they are doing is not being done by the right people. I, I told somebody recently, this was funny, I told somebody recently that what we do in UX, this is, I said, we're not flipping burgers over here. 
And one of the people who didn't like what I said responded by saying, I like flipping burgers. <laughs> you are completely missing the point. <laughs> We're not flipping burgers. So go ahead and, and run with it from there. Democratization is not what people think it is. No. And so I think it's laughable to, to assume, like, I, I, first of all, before I get to, to what's laughable, I agree <laughs> that it is okay for product managers, designers, marketers, anybody in the business to look at evidence and generate their own insights. Yep. But that is not what democratization means in many cases. <laughs> Even if you look at the Nielsen Norman page, it basically says making research available to all. Mm. It is a Trojan horse that yes. poses as fairness for all, but is really a cover for the devaluation of professional researchers. Yes, it is. It, it sh- <laughs> research is a, a, a specialized function. The main issues here, as I see them, are one, what you've already described. There's opportunity costs of having non-researchers conduct research. Yep. When you have a product manager conducting research, they can't be doing product management. They yep. can't do two things at once. They forego doing something else, the definition of opportunity cost. Context switching. You're asking people to spend part of their day doing one job, part of their day doing another. It's hard to do- juggle a dozen balls. It's much easier to toss just one. Let a professional researcher do their job. And then there's this idea. I love it. It's the idea of gatekeeping. Like, Gatekeeping is a loaded term because yes, I am gatekeeping and it is not bad. I am keeping people away from doing something (laughs) that they have no business doing. It's like, um, like, it's like saying we're gatekeeping people who aren't physicians from practicing medicine. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly what we do. Exactly. We make physicians take an exam, go through a residency, go through a fellowship before they can conduct surgery. They don't just let me go conduct surgery. <laughs> oh my God, they're gatekeeping. Yes, they're gatekeeping. And that's okay. It's a good thing. Yeah, um, it's, it's, the al- <laughs> idea of opening the gates and allowing everyone to conduct research, it's a slippery slope. It's death. Um, yeah. And going back to what I was saying, it's re- the value of research isn't in the tools. Maze, dovetail, cool. You can use a tool that doesn't make you a researcher. And that's not what the value of research is. And then finally, the difference between UX and market research, that line is, is gotten blurry. UX research has traditionally focused on human computer interaction, usability, the way people interact with products, and maybe even the way the problem spaces at at the individual or customer consumer level. And market research has traditionally looked at the aggregate using surveys and other secondary research sources or other things to understand the markets they serve, really focusing on context. The problem with that thinking is that it is difficult to understand why customers and consumers act in a certain way without understanding the context in which they are behaving, mm-hmm. which is why that convergence of UX and market research is so important. I think that we need to stop seeing ourselves as separate teams and start seeing ourselves as a single function. We should be forming strategic insights and foresights teams. These teams would work together to form a holistic picture, to be the single source of truth to help make better decisions. They would pull together context and consumer behavior into one one place. That's dynamite. That's a, that's a fantastic idea. I never heard anybody say that before. It makes sense. <laughs> I'm full of things that make sense sometimes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I'm glad to ask you that. But that's going to bring us to a close. Thank you again, Ari, for taking this time to, to share with the UX community. Folks are going to absolutely love this. Of course, we got to get together and do this again. But before we wrap up, let's go ahead and leave some time for you to give some closing remarks, as well as telling the audience about the wonderful new UX research learning resource that you and Dr. Nick have. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate it. I'm excited to have been here. This has been an awesome experience, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Um, Dr. Nick Fine and I have been working on the Cult of Curiosity, which is a research community for researchers by researchers. It's uh, You can find it at cultofcuriosity.community um, to sign up. Also, uh, we've been working on a course called The Influential Researcher. So a lot of the things that we talked about today regarding the last mile of research and how to elevate the practice We teach in that course uh, through the science of UX and the science, art and science of influence. Um, You can hit me up on LinkedIn and find out how to register there or also through the cult of curiosity. I really appreciate it. 
Awesome. Awesome. So thank you again, Dr. Ari. Looking forward to it. Folks, tap into the resources he's provided. You're going to absolutely love it. And so that's it for today. We are out of time. Again, looking forward to doing this again. Uh, But until next time, it's time to sign off. This is Darren Hood, the host of The World of UX. Happy UXing, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.